So EU-China relations is really a very complicated and big issue. Uh, we know that in the recent years, the EU-China relations are developing very fast, but there are also some kind of disputes or problems. So what will it happen and what will it evolve in the future? And well, that is a very complicated issue. So here I just talk something about my personal opinion from the perspective of a common Chinese, uh, common Chinese professor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my topic is about the prospects of the future of the China-EU relations. After the China-EU summit and the 2020 strategic agenda for cooperation, and we know that uh, EU and China are important. So if we want to look at the strategic pattern of China and EU relations, perhaps we shall first uh, explore something over the exact positions of China and EU in the world currently. Now, of course, first is that China and the EU are the two of the largest economies of the world. For example, this is a statistical data which shows that now recently in the year 2012, according to the data calculated by IMF, the China and the EU are two of the largest economies of the world. The EU as a whole, of course, accounts for the largest proportion of the GDP total of the world, and the United States is the second largest one, and then China is the third largest one. So here, from this statistical data, we can see that China and the EU are both very important, and are both relatively big in terms of the economic skills. And because they are big and they are important, it's inevitable that they will get in touch with each other, and it's inevitable that they shall negotiate, get in touch with each other, or cooperate with each other in many fields of the world and the regional affairs. And also, we can see that very interestingly that uh, the relative positions of EU, China, and the United States and other major players in the past three decades might relatively change a little bit. So that might bring some new variables or new impacts towards the pattern of the world order. Now here, this is also the data that I collect from the IMF, and I turned it into this graph, this figure. Now here it shows that in the past three decades, the major countries' GDPs as percentages of the world total. If we look at this, we can see that um, now this line, the top line is the EU as a whole. Its GDP as a percentage of the world total. In the past three decades, here we can see that the EU's relative position of the world is gradually declining a little bit, perhaps. And uh, this second line, this dark green one, is US GDP as a percentage of the world total. It is also perhaps a little bit declines. Now here we see that in the 1980, the EU's GDP is one-third of the world total, around one-third. And then on the last year, it is around one-fifth of the world total, right? And here, the United States, in the 1980s, the United States is one-fourth, and now around one-fifth. And this line, this purple line, is China's GDP as percentage of the world total. If you look at the data, we will find out that in the 1980s, the China's GDP was less than 5% of the world total. But uh, after three decades of very quick development, the China's GDP now accounts for uh, around 15% of the world's total. So the relative positions are changing, which also brings some, I think inevitably, brings some kind of change to the world order and also to the Mm, relations of the different economies and also different players of international relations. So the new changes and the important positions will inevitably, inevitably push EU and China together. The second important point is that China and the EU are all the major forces shaping the global politics. I think this is known to everyone. And the third point is just we talked the relative changes of the rel relative relations of China and the EU in the world economy. So these are the three points that I think can explain the 
uh, current positions of EU and China in the world. So this means that there is a very strong basis for China and the EU to inevitably get engaged with each other. This is the first point. Sorry. Now, um, as for the relations between two players, I think that they are forces, they are always forces to push in, to push the players together, and they are always forces to pull the forces apart. Um, I, I remember that when I was in middle school, the physics teacher told us that when the two atoms are too far away from each other, they might be attracted and they might approach each other. And when the two atoms are too close to each other, and then the attracting forces might be overwhelmed by the repulsive forces, and then the two atoms might get a little bit far away from each other. This is a physical rule. But I think that in the international relations, sometimes there are always the similar phenomenon that is uh, sometimes when the two players are far away from each other, but they have some internal or inherent demand to get closer, to approach, to get more cooperation or to get more coordination, they will gradually approach each other. But at the same time, there might be some forces to uh, pull them apart or get, get them just get away from each other. So this is also a kind of international relations phenomenon, perhaps. So I think that if we want to look at the future of the EU-China relations, perhaps we shall look at some of the forces that can push China and EU together. And uh, from the, my understanding, I make the summarization over uh, these four forces that, can, that, that could push China and EU together. The first one is the demand for both sides to promote the mutual trade. If we look at the trade, this uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon that is now there is a triangular pattern in the world trade. This is, I think, a consensus of some kind of the economic studies. That is, we know that the EU and the US is on the one part of the triangular, and then for the developed East Asian countries such as Japan, such as the four Asian tigers, they are on the other side, and then China and the ASEAN countries on the on another side. So it's it forms a triangular. The technology and the capital flows from the United States and the EU relatively to Japan and the four Asian tigers. And also the technology and the capital flows from Japan and the four Asian tigers to China, mainland China, and the Southeast Asian countries. And uh, at the same time, cheap consumer goods flows from China and ASEAN to the EU and the United States. Relatively more sophisticated and expensive goods flows from the United States to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. And the Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan also produce their relatively cheaper but also sophisticated goods. And then these goods or these products flows from them to mainland China and ASEAN countries. And so as for the trade side, the China is, um, the, the China's trade position is relatively not very favorable, perhaps. Um, if we look at the so-called famous smiling curve of the distribution of the value of a product, that we can see that China, because of its huge labor force in the past, and also because of its uh, general economic uh, demographic conditions, it's on the lowest part of the value chains. So it can usually export relatively cheap consumer goods its trade structures are relatively, is relatively on the lower end. But the situation is always changing. And so the China trade with major economies also is changing in the past several decades. Now here, this is also a calculation that I take the data from the China's National Statistical Bureau. And here it shows the trade, the total volume of China's trade with major economies as a percentage of, of China's total foreign trade, which means just the how much proportion China's trade with a specific economy takes to the total. And it, sh it shows the relative changes of China's trade relations with major economies here. Now here uh, we can see again, now we will see that China EU trade is maintaining a kind of the steady pace. It is still on a very important position. While this line is China-US trade, can you see that? 
the China-U.S. trade is relatively declining. Uh, there are many reasons. Um, I think that economists may have made a lot of researches of this. Why is the relative importance of China-U.S. trade in the recent years declined? Perhaps because of the more and more protectionist trend in the U.S. policymaking and in the U.S. Um, society, or perhaps because of the shrinking of the market of demand for China consumer goods after the 2008 crisis. Just in recent years, it declined. But anyway, China-EU trade is maintaining still a steady pace, which means that China-EU trade is still very important for us and for the Europe. And uh, this is China-Japan trade. It's proportion to the total. The China-Japan tra trade is this purple line. So the China-Japan trade is also declining. There's much, much more complicated uh, analysis. For example, we know that in the last year and in the year before last, the Diaoyu Island dispute between China and Japan, this actually contribute a lot to the sudden or disruptive changes of the China-Japan economic relations. Um, after the dispute, up, after the breakout of the dispute, after the the, the collision of the sh of the fish, fishing boats, the Chinese tourist to the Japan actually it, it was reduced by a great margin, and also now the it, it was said and it is said now that the Chinese uh, the, the Japanese car manufacturers now are finding it more and more difficult to sell more cars in China's market. It's relatively a very uh, delicate relations. And, and so here, from this figure, we can just uh, find out that actually the China-EU trade is still maintaining a very important position, which means EU is important to us. And, uh, I think China is also important for EU. So the trade is still a very fundamental force that could push or bring China and the EU together. The second is the demand for both side, of both sides for broader access to the mutual investment. And if you look at the 2020 strategic agenda for more cooperation between EU and China, you may find that the mutual investment is a very important or key issue that are concerned by the policymakers and the researchers and the academics of both sides. And so let's look at the investment. But still, there is much, much space for the development of the investment because the EU's investment in China still relatively takes a minor proportion to the total foreign direct investment that flows into China. This is also a statistics that I calculated from the data collected from the China's National Statistical Bureau. And here you will find that actually the investment from Hong Kong, this green one, is, the most, is a major proportion of the total foreign direct investment that flows into the mainland China. And uh, the EU and the US investment in China relatively takes a smaller proportion. It's not very, very important. So it means that we have much more broad space to attract more EU investment if conditions permit, if there's a relatively more um, comfortable environment. And this is the country distribution of EU direct investment in China, into China uh, from the past decade. Now here, these are the different, uh, here I just collected data about the different countries FDI into China. Uh, mainly we will find that Germany um, is relatively always important. Now here, this is the orange red section of the, each column. Can you see that? We know that Germany has a very huge, uh, has a very large investment in the industry of China. The automotive industry, the chemical industry, and uh, many, many industries of manufacturing of Germany put investment in China. So Germany always takes a very important position. And as for other countries, I think Netherlands um, also increases its uh, investment in China. Ne Netherlands, the whole land in China, in Chinese we call it Hulan. Uh, they had a substantial investment in the manufacturing uh, sector in some of the electronics or something like that. Sorry. 
This is a breakdown of the major FDI sources into China in some total. Um, I think it, it, it reflects a similar pattern. This is also a similar pattern of Shanghai. In Shanghai, the situation perhaps a little bit different is that um, in Shanghai, the investment from the Europe and from the United States takes a larger proportion because Shanghai is relatively a more internationalized city with relatively perhaps more complete or um, better infrastructure for investment. In other provinces of China, particularly in the southeastern provinces such as Guangdong or Zhejiang, um, perhaps just the, the investment from Japan and uh, South Korea and uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong will take a larger proportion to the total. Now let's look at China's investment to other countries. And for China, again, we can see that because Chinese are more similar to the uh, Asia, East Asia, so China's investment mainly into, oh, sorry, into East Asia, into Asia, and China's investment in the Europe relatively still takes a much smaller proportion to the total. Okay. And this is another statistics uh, reflecting the similar pattern. Okay. So I will not make too much explanation, perhaps. Uh, here, ODI, sorry. ODI, it's a term that usually Chinese like to use. ODI here means, ODI means overseas direct investment, which means investment flowing from China to other countries. Understand? And the China's investment in Europe and in the United States sometimes encounter some unexpected difficulties. There are some vigilance, there are some uh, kind of say, obstructions to the Chinese investment because uh, here we can see that the majority of China's investment actually in the overseas, in the foreign countries are made by the state-owned corporations. And because state-owned corporation has a government background, so usually I think that in the United States and in the Europe, people may not be, um, may, may not be so friendly towards the state-owned corporation's investment. And so th that might be a reason. But anyway, those foreign-funded corporations, those foreign investment in China, uh, actually has got a very good reputation. And they hope to expand some kind of the investment if condition permits. And the Chinese people really uh, um, attach great importance to the foreign investment into Chinese industries. And Chinese people and policymakers also hope that the foreign direct investment in China could be expanded substantially in the future. And this is a list of the top 10 foreign funded corporations in China, or the 10 largest foreign funded corporations in China. And we can see that you will find that here, the European-based corporations account for a majority of the top 10 foreign-funded corporations in China here. Now we can find Germany. Germany, there are three German corporations in this list. And uh, one Finland corporation, one Sweden, one France. So here, in these top 10 corporations, we can see that actually, the substantial economic connection between China and Europe actually is strong. And so it's reasonable that in China, people really hope that in the future, this stronger relation could be expanded, could be promoted further and further. Okay. And this is the top 10 foreign-funded corporations in Shanghai. And here, Germany's corporation still takes a relatively dominating position. These are all the calculations made by, uh, I think, by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. And another very important aspect that will bring China closer to the Europe is China's demands for EU's expertise on the sustainable development. The European Union is a mature economy uh, it has relatively complete and uh, perfect legal environment. Uh, its policy making towards its uh, market, towards its trade, towards its 
its investments relatively are experienced and sophisticated. And so the European Union has much experience and uh, expertise and know-how about how to maintain the economy um, moving relatively on a smooth course or a smooth pace. That is China, what China needs because China's economy is developing um, sometimes not so steady, uh, at a not so steady pace. China's economy actually is developing always full of ups and downs or twists and turns. Um, people always say that China maintains a high speed growth, but if you look at the China's GDP growth in the past three decades, you will find that the China's growth is always full of ups and downs. It's not a steady one. Um, now here you will see that this is a, now this blue line is the GDP growth rate in China in the past decades, in the past three decades around. Now here you will see many ups and downs because China's economy's pace is closely connected to its political situations and also the world environment. And here the recent, the most recent peak is on the 2007, 2007, this one. Uh, 2007, the U.S. market, the U.S. real estate market got its peak of prosperity. And the U.S. demand towards China's cheap consumer goods perhaps um, rose to the highest level. And uh, there was uh, prosperity in the whole world economy. So China's export really plays a, played a very important role to promote China's GDP growth rate. And then we can see that up to 2007, 2008, and so on, the China's economy's GDP growth rate is gradually falls down and then up a little bit and then fall down a little bit. There's always ups and downs because you know that there's so-called the, the dual engine of China's economic growth. So what are the dual engine? Yes, very good. So export is usually, the export is usually propelled by the private sector of China's economy. The Chinese private, uh, private corporations uh, played as a major role to push the export. So from the 2007, when the export market is, was shrinking, gradually the Chinese government depended more and more on the heavy investment of, of the infrastructure project to push up the economic growth, to push up the GDP level. And that will bring some time to bring some problems because we all know that there is a rule in the economy which causes a diminishing marginal return of the investment. Um, so China's demand for the EU's expertise is connected to China's characteristic of its current economic structure. Uh, because China's economic structure needs more upgrading, so China needs EU more, not only needs EU's export market and investment, but also needs more cooperation about technological transfer, about EU's expertise and something like that. So let's look at China's economic structure. Um, first is that China's econo economy is, for the past several de decades, propelled or pushed by the dominance of the labor-intensive manufacturing sectors. Now here this is the China's industrial structure in the past three decades. This red one is the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing sector still, in these years, it still accounts for uh, around 40% or less than four, or a little bit less than forty percent of the total GDP. Um, this means that manufacturing dominates China's economy, but usually it's service sectors that might get higher profit rate, that might uh, bring more returns. So this economic structure need need to be upgraded. Oh, this is Shanghai economic structure. So here you will see that if we take Shanghai as a, as an example. Now, Shanghai's economic structure is also still um, dominated by the manufacturer. It's not like Hong Kong. Hong Kong is largely financial-based or financial-oriented, but Shanghai is still relatively largely manufacturer-oriented. Um, this is a general pattern. This is a distribution of Shanghai's I will not talk too much. And because of China's economy is largely um, export and uh, 
investment based. So the investment now becomes a leading force to push up China's economic growth. And here, uh, sorry. Uh, this is the uh, investment rate of major countries in the past three decades. Now here, the data is collected from IMF. Now here again, you can see that actually, the China's investment rate is much, much higher than many of the other countries. Now here you will see that this yellow line is China's investment rate. It is higher. So investment means huge saving. And uh, this economic structure is uh, relatively rigid and not very flexible. And so when the economic growth rate becomes a major concern for the policymakers, the whole structure needs an overhaul. And how to do this overhaul? We need the expertise or knowledge from the Europe, and we need more cooperation and coordination with the EU. Okay. This is, another, some, this is some of the data I just admitted, I think it's. Well, second is that China demands for the EU's expertise on the urbanization process. Uh, in the coastal areas of China, it is highly urbanized for some parts. But in the inland China, it is still far away from a relatively mature urbanization because China is a large country with a large territory. So here you will find in the 2020 strategic cooperation agenda for China and the EU, the cooperation or coordination between China and EU for the urbanization takes uh, major attention from many of the Chinese leaders. And so here, now China has uh, escalated or relatively um, imbalanced economic structure. <coughs> the distribution of the income of GDP level, of GDP per capita level is highly imbalanced. This pattern cannot be changed so easily. This means that in China, the urbanization also could be pushed in an escalated way. And how to push this? It needs a kind of internal coherence. We know that in the EU's policy agendas, the EU's internal coherence is a very important part, or perhaps from our perspective, we are very interested in the EU's policy about coherence, about regional coherence, about some kind of regional or internal coordination. This is a part that attracts China's attention greatly because we also have a highly imbalanced structure. Now, this, is, this data is old. It's about uh, around the, uh, more than 10 years ago, the China's income distribution level. The brighter the color means the higher the level of the income of that province is. Understand? So here you will see the coastal areas much more wealthy than the inland areas. It's a highly imbalanced one. And this is the uh, income structure distribution of the GDP per capita for different provinces in 2008. It's a similar structure. And this is 2010. Still, the general pattern has not been changed. And this is a prediction over the distribution of the GDP per capita level for 2015. Still similar pattern. So this means China's distribution, China has a high level imbalance of the geographical distribution of the economic resources and income levels. So China's urbanization process will also be a kind of the imbalanced one, and we need help from the European Union about the expertise, uh, for the expertise about the coherence. This is also a, a statistical data showing the imbalance of the income of different di regions. So we have talked about two major forces that are pushing China closer to EU. China has such an inherent demand for more cooperation from EU. And also, I think that China and EU share some of the major interests on some of the global and regional affairs. Uh, I heard from some of the people in the Brussels who said that now there is a power shift um, in the world that China and the United States seem to be playing a more and more influential role in the East Asia or Northeast Asia's regional security affairs. And the EU shall also have, has its own saying in the 
regional affairs about Northeast Asia. So this means that EU and China share some common interest. First is uh, common interest about regional economic integration. We here, if we compare the regional economic integration, oh, sorry, no, 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 no. If we compare the regional economic integration of the Europe and the of East Asia, we may find that the Europe is highly developed. Now this is a more detailed comparison of the regional integration level of East Asia and uh, Europe. Now here we will find that the East Asia is still on the level of establishing broader free trade areas, FTAs, or favorable trading areas. But the European Union not only has created its own Eurozone, but also is also considering some kind of a fiscal union or banking union. So in terms of regional integration, I think EU can offer a lot of the experiences and knowledges to the East Asia and the East Asia countries, including China. When we are thinking about how to push the East Asia economic integration, we might need help from EU and we might perhaps uh, have more opportunity to cooperate more closely with EU. Uh, as for the East Asia's economic integration, this is a structure of the East Asia's bilateral uh, integration mechanism already in effect. Uh, it is still incomplete, and it only covers a part of the East Asia. So it's, it needs more perfection. Uh, this is uh, the, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the blueprint for the East Asia economic integration in the future. Uh, these are the proposals made by policymakers of China or Japan or Korea. There are much talks about this, particularly the uh, East Asia FTA3. Um, the Chinese, I think the Chinese academics and the Chinese policymakers really um, have a great expectation on the East Asia FTA 3, the East Asia free trade area. The East Asia free trade area includes China, uh, mainland China, and also South Korea and Japan, and if possible, Taiwan. Um, but there are still talks, and uh, no substantial achievement has ever been uh, made already, perhaps on this kind of mechanism, particularly after the, de after the deterioration of the China-Japan relations. And now there are talks of the TIPP, oh, sorry. Uh, there are talks about the TPP in the East Asia. They are more complicated. It is more complicated. So there, there are much, much researches of the East Asia economic integration that we might think that the, the Europe might give a hand to us. And then the security affairs or strategic relations of the East Asia, Southeast Asia. First is the Korean Peninsula. I think everyone knows this. Uh, some of my friends are actually working on the Korean studies. And, and the situation on the Korean Peninsula um, is it, not so good, actually. The Cold War has never ended in East Asia. It has never ended in East Asia. So there is still, still Cold War confrontations. So um, we, in Europe, uh, many scholars, uh, I found many literatures in Europe and many scholars in Europe say uh, since the end of the Cold War, blah, 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 blah. But actually, I think from the Chinese perspective or from the East Asia perspective, the Cold War has not ended. There are still much security concerns about this. And there's Diaoyu Islands dispute that got escalated in the past several years. There are many reasons for this. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hmm? Hmm? Yes. You, you know where is Diaoyu Islands, right? Ah, great, okay. Yes. And also South China Sea disputes. This is another great potential danger. And still there's no substantial settlement for this. And I heard someone from the EAS which says that, which says that the EU is interested to participate in the negotiations or the settlement for the uh, security issues of this region. Uh, I don't know exactly how is that, 
But anyway, this is a great concern now enters the major strategic thinking of Chinese academics and policymakers about the Southeast, uh, about, uh, about the South China Sea. There are many of these, many conditions, many data and materials. I will not talk too much about this. Well, this is, uh, is, is the time okay? Yeah, another few minutes. Okay. This is about the, now we have talked about the forces that could push China and EU together, could bring China and EU closer. And particularly, I talk about the Chinese perspective uh, in which fields we need the EU, and we hope to get more coordination from EU. And now let's look at some of the current forces that might pull China and EU apart. Uh, I think these several forces that might put, pull China and EU apart First, it's still about the economics, about the trade imbalance. Uh, as for the bilateral trade imbalance, um, EU and the United States are always the two trade partners that might get the largest trade deficit from its trade with China. Um, here it is. And this issue will remain, I think, a dividing issue, perhaps, between China and EU. But relatively, I think it's not so difficult to get some settlement because after some negotiations, there will always be some arrangement. I think that this may not be very difficult, but this is still an issue. The, the trade deficit, deficit of EU with China. This is another statistics, similar pattern. Oh, this is, sorry. Okay. Uh, this is China's total volumes of export and import with major trade partners in the recent years. We can see that. And of course, here China means mainland China. And here we will see that always EU and the United States and Hong Kong are the, third, are the three economies that got largest deficits from its, from its trade with China. While at the same time, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan are always the biggest winner from their trade with China. They make a lot of money each year from their trade with China. These are some of the statistics. Well, statistics are always monotonous. And uh, so in recent years, the EU's dissatisfaction with this trade imbalance has been increasing. So from China, we made some statistics over uh, European Commission's anti-dumping and countervailing. Um, investigations against China in the past several years. And we will find that actually the EU's uh, anti-dumping and countervailing <coughs> investigation cases against China actually account for over one-third of its total cases in the past several years. That means the situation is really relatively serious, perhaps. Um, the trade disputes are a great concern for many Chinese academics and policymakers and also for the Chinese industries because the EU and the United States are two of the largest markets for China's private sectors, and also for some of China's state-owned corporations. So whenever there are disputes, there will always be an internal negotiation and coordination mechanism for Chinese industries and Chinese policymakers to get united together to work out some proposals. So I think this is a great concern. And in the future, this is an issue that will attract Chinese concerns. So nowadays, the Chinese corporations are beginning to think about lobbying in the EU. When I came to the Irish embassy in Brussels to apply for a visa, it was amazing for me to find that the, a very famous Chinese corporation is located in the same building as the Irish embassy in Brussels. Now, can you find that? Huawei is a very famous Chinese corporation. Telecommunica uh, it, it is about telecommunication technologies. This corporation was very ambitious in the past several years to expand its investment in the United States and in the European Union. But unexpectedly, it got much frustrations because the US Congress conducting some investigations against Huawei and, say to, and said to Huawei that you cannot merge this corporation, you cannot buy that. And then in Europe, 
Huawei also encountered serious setbacks or frustrations. So now um, Huawei established a representative office in the Brussels to do some work. And I heard very interesting that someone says that it is now learning the skills to do some lobbying. Lobbying is a totally new phenomenon for Chinese <laughs> because of the difference of the political systems, perhaps. But now we are, I think the Chinese corporations are learning to do this. This is a very new phenomenon. It's, it's totally new, it's, but it's very interesting. So uh, I have talked about the major um, forces that might try to pull China and the EU apart. There are disputes about the trade imbalance. There are EU's distrust about China's um, about the China's investment, and also about the China's uh, also about the social effects that China will bring to the Europe after its investment. For example, in the European Union, there are independent trade unions, and there are very high level of standards for labor for environmental protection. But these are new phenomena that Chinese corporations might sometimes do not know anything at all. So when China makes investment to the European Union, these uh, social issues might become uh, kind of the source of dispute. And the third one is uh, issues related to the human rights and democracy. This is about the different perceptions of Chinese uh, officials and policymakers and the EU about the more deep, deep-rooted differences of the uh, political sides of EU-China relations. I think many researchers have made some research over this. So these are the current forces of the obstructions for further development of the EU-China relations. So let's get the conclusion. We know that, uh, sorry, we know that when a couple get married, they will never really imagine what will be the future of their marriage. Um, perhaps just after a period of time, uh, these couples, uh -huh. uh, after a period of time, these couple might just gradually alienated from each other. Uh, when they find some uh, differences, they will. So you know that the love has never been a lasting thing. When the <laughs> love goes thin, there will be some disputes. I think the same situation is for the EU-China relations. There will be always the coexistence of the disputes and the pushing forces. So it's okay. It's okay. So anyway, I think that in the future, there are some forces push China and EU together, and there are some forces pull China and EU far apart. But I think that the pushing forces will be larger than the, than the pulling forces. There will be coexistence of disputes, quarrels, and the coordinations. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Professor.